some of uh, some of the committee had to take we a can seven start. Okay, the um, Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration meetings called to order. Um, first uh, action item is the approval of the minutes. Uh, I presume we've all had a chance to review them. Are there any um, changes, comments? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The minutes are approved. Now we move on to our policy <coughs> items. And I'll ask uh, Acting General Counsel Jane Sovereign <coughs> to produce, uh, to uh, rather uh, present the uh, first uh, item uh, relating to uh, guidelines for presidential searches. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, you all may remember uh, that this item was discussed uh, at the uh, last <coughs> meeting, the February meeting, um, and that there was uh, the sense of the committee was that, um, well, just to step back for a moment, the change that was uh, the subject of discussion was having um, essentially uh, external uh, representatives uh, to be potentially part of the search committee um, as part of the group of trustees, <coughs> senior level administrators, and then they could be external uh, uh, representatives. And there was a request from the committee to define that a little more precisely and to have some parameters. And so the revised language uh, essentially says um, the total number of appointed trustees and senior level administrators and or external constituent representatives shall not exceed five. External constituent representatives shall have a record of significant commitment to the campus and may include alumni or donors, but may not be elected officials or staff members of, of elected officials. What, what section are we reading from? Um, this is on page two, uh, Trustee Gribbets. Um, it is in the, um, on my copy of the red line. Um, it is in the third paragraph on page two, um, and where the, it's the one with a lot of red in it, um, and it starts th with the words senior level administrators. So I believe as the committee knows that um, the other changes were essentially um, just minimal cleanup and including the Graduate School of Public Health um, in this process. Um, and that's really the, um, and, and the diversity language was uh, made more current. Um, so uh, those, those are the changes uh, to the guidelines. Before, uh, before any uh, questions or comments, uh, can I have a motion to approve and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. Questions and comments on these changes? Mr. Barnard. So um, we discussed this rather extensively um, at the executive committee of the University Faculty Senate. And um, I think in general we're um, happy with the direction that this is going. Um, and we think expanding the um, number of people or the kinds of people who can sit on these searches is generally a good thing. Um, I think where there were concerns, we felt that those concerns could be addressed. Um, and, and we were thinking of proposing uh, language to suggest that maybe there should be consultation with the campus of some sort uh, in determining, you know, in a particular case, um, uh, whether a, um, you know an external, a particular external constituent was a good one to add to a uh, to a search committee. Um, my understanding is that that general that that does happen when the search committees are being constituted, because there's consultation about <coughs> the alumnus or alumna who is on the committee, and that this would be part of that 
existing consultation that happens. Um, and since the individual does have to have, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a record um, of significant commitment, you know, I think that, uh, I don't think there needs to be a requirement in the guidelines. I think there will be, con I mean, I think there is already and would be consultation uh, for the, the composition. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. In, in almost all circumstances, there would be. I just think that some faculty would feel reassured if there was just some genuflection to the idea of campus consultation. Um, um, I mean, could perhaps we could, uh, um, I'm just trying to think, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I think it would, would sort of tie up the policy by sort of getting into various specifics of consultation because if you have consultation for this but not that, I'm wondering if there's a place we could put that oh, um, earlier know, that, on. Would, yeah. that would sort of reflect the sense of the body that consultation is important with the campus is, is important. Um, We'd certainly be open to that. So, and that we could even have something on the record at the at the board meeting, you know, with that being acknowledged, if that would be acceptable um, to everyone, you know, to have comments and that being acknowledged as part of the record of the adoption. Right. <clears throat> Does anyone else have a? I, I don't understand this. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to see the end of the day. There are five trustees can be appointed. Oh, they, they can. Right. Not trustees. Up to five trustees appointed by the chairperson of the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I, I correct? Right. And then there are three tenured faculty. Yes. And then we have senior level administrators or and or representatives of external constituencies. They are part of the five trustees. There's the, tr there's the, the bundle is tr up to five people that trustees senior level administrators and, or ex external constituents. So that's the, a modification. In other words, yes. until, uh, if, we, if we adopt this, there can no longer be five trustees. There could be. <clears throat> in other words, there's the, flexibility in that category. There could be, all five of those people could be trustees. But if we want to appoint a external constituent representative with significant commitment to the campus and may include alumni or donors, but may not be elected officials. In order for them to come, it's at the expense of a trustee. Um, or a senior level administrator. Yes. Right. It seems to come out of senior level administrators. Yeah. Actually, from the way I see this configured and right work. and the, but the senior level administrators are now the, an external representative is added to that mix is that right that's right right so it doesn't come out of the three tenured faculty no no the faculty so if, and, if, and the student representation stays the unchanged the same. so okay why are we doing this I, think I mean, why are we doing it at the expense of possibly a trustee vote? I think that the, the idea is that... What? I don't know that's what it says. Well, explain it to me. Okay, I'm lost. I'm lost. Well, there, there, there would be... Um, so th there will be uh, up to five trustees. I think that, uh, as I understand it, that there was a sense that there were times when some trustees who had participated in a number of searches were, were would would have liked a little break from, and that they that the, they might have been a little tired from a number of searches, and that there was an interest in having some flexibility in this category. So, um, for the so sake of clarity, let's just define what this universe is. Sure. Because, you know, Trustee Gribbets makes a very good point, but let's, we're talking about five. Right. Yep. Some combination right. of, if I, if my reading of the English language still works at this time of day, trustees, 
up to five, but that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. number loses some meaning in paragraph three. Uh, senior level administrators and faculty. Um, no, um, se senior level administrators and, and external, external, cons yes. external folks. Ah. The faculty are separate and they remain the same proportion and the students are separate and they remain. Okay. And then there's, there's already one alumnus or alumna um, and this gives the flexibility of within that group to have, because I know that the chancellor and others had expressed significant interest in having folks who have a significant connection to the college, like alumni, like donors, like others who have given a lot to the college and are very, um, they're people who can help with recruiting, um, who have the best interest of the college at heart, and that's what the interest is in some cases. And there's flexibility here so that maybe it would be five trustees, maybe it would be three trustees and two uh, administrators, mm -hmm. but that there's a flexibility to include um, uh, a repre you know, representatives of external. So the only thing that could change from search to search is the mix of that of, group right. of trustees, of trustees senior level yes. administrators, and exactly and external, external exactly. people. But can I ask a question? And I'm sorry, I know Michael already made a comment for us, and I apologize, I came in late. I guess to your point, Jane, that there was a concern that the trustees, you know, would be bogged down with day-long searches, which I can totally relate to. After you've done a couple, maybe you don't want to do more. It, it kind of raised the question in my mind then, if that was one of the rationales, why it wasn't in the trustee section. But more importantly, as I hope Michael already communicated to you, we support the idea that there might be external constituents that are very valuable and that could be helpful to a search. And we don't even think that, you know, we should have be having to try to define them and say they're not this and they're not that. We would just like to see in the exceptions to these guidelines section something that simply says, you know, if there are times when external constituents are needed for whatever reason, <clears throat> that consultation would be made with the faculty governance and the student governance of the related campus. And we know consultation is a very low bar here at CUNY. It means more or less most of the time you tell us. But we don't see that as being a, a very big thing. They that's just, not the, I, I understand. I, I so, disagree with what you said, right. but that's not the issue for me. Right. No, I realize okay. your other issue is the trustees and. Well, yes. Exactly. You Which I have a situation mm -hmm. where we want five trustees right. and we want the external involvement. Well, we still have an alumna or an alumnus. And we, yes, and, yes, all right. So we But have, in other words. Right. If this is giving us more flexibility, not less. May, may I suggest you? Well, uh, 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 to me, more flexibility is that if uh, the chancellor wants to put a external representative on, he can do it at the same time as he has five trustees. So it's not the flexibility. It's, I think it limits flexibility. Part of the concern was that the proportion of faculty and students on the committee remain the same and that they not be <clears throat> that 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 is an important value mm -hmm. in these searches and that remains the same and that Unchanged. remains the same mm -hmm. so so in other words there wasn't a desire to add another person to the total mix it was a desire to keep the total mix the same and have a little bit more flexibility within the mix mm -hmm. But so it's not to get bogged down in semantics. What does consultation mean? What does notice mean? Um, I presume general counsel can advise us on it because when somebody puts out a term that is suggestive of a process, we all ought to know what it means before we accept the term. Yeah, we've actually asked for that many times in other instances when it's suggested in something else that we because I'm not certain, certain we're not. I'm not certain that, you know, okay, does consult mean ask your consent? I don't know about that. Right. Consult means ask your opinion and listen. That's and, and that's how it's been account. interpreted here. Then, and take then it if into that account. then that's if that there is a clear understanding of that from the committee, I don't see why we need to get bogged down further in any of the other you know, if this is a good proposal, doesn't need a, an amendment, 
because that's our <coughs> understanding of it. That is clearly our intent. We are recorded. Minutes are taken. We have defined what we mean by this. But, but right now it doesn't call for consultation. If we're saying it is our intent that there be consultation. I think it's our intent that there be consultation with the campus. I believe that's what I heard you say. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, and that, that, my understanding is that happens when these committees are put together. Um, I, I don't think there's a specific intent to consult with, you know, I, I don't know how it typically works with faculty or student <clears throat> governance on that. Um, well, my understanding <clears throat> is the way it works now, and someone else who served on a search can correct me, but right now the campus involvement is limited to asking the campus for the faculty representatives, but we're not consulted or considered about any of the other representatives. Right, but not the faculty, but, the, but I think the campus is also asked about the, alum, the alumnus or the president alumnus. of the college or something. Presumably, yeah. Well, or if there's an alumnus yeah. or um, uh, yeah. also senior level administrators, right. I think also there would be consultation there too. Right. But I thought you and I, though, were, were heading in the direction of maybe putting something earlier in the document that stressed consultation. Or was I misinterpreting what you were saying? Um, I mean, what what um, uh, what I was talking about was campus consultation, yeah. not necessarily, you know, specific consultation with with the faculty governance body at the campus. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that's a cha that my understanding is that would be a change from what's being done. Right. Um, you know, to I'm Trustee Ferrer's point in terms of language, when we say campus consultation, if we use that term, that often means you've spoken to the president. I mean, that doesn't mean you've spoken to anybody else. So again, if, if we're saying that the understanding is consultation simply means you inform and ask opinions, that's such a low bar that to simply say, if you want to expand the search to an external constituency, you inform and ask an opinion. It doesn't mean you have to take their opinion. It doesn't mean you have to agree. Is there also an explicit understanding that this does not imply consent? Yes. I mean, we've seen that uh, a multitude of times. We, OK. We, yeah. Yes. So that's why we think asking for that is pretty nominal. Is there any issue with that? Well, um, I, I can't fully speak for the chancellor. Um, okay. I, I, I think that he wanted to, I think he's comfortable with campus consultation rather than you know, going to each specific piece of governance, you know, on every search. Oh, no. If it's campus consultation, which is what I heard you say. Well, I had said campus, and right. you're saying governance. Saying. I, I think well, no, no, yeah. you know, come on. I'm That's sorry. Not... I realize we had this word, and I We spoke... can't over-lawyer this thing. No, no, no. I don't want to over-lawyer it. And I spoke with Chica beforehand. Um, the student representatives agree with us that it needs to say governance, because campus means the president. It doesn't mean we find out about it. If I may... Um... There's a clear uh, place for consultation with governance in terms of selecting faculty. I think there's a broader role for consultation with whomever is leading the institution at the time, the president, president's cabinet, maybe foundation board members, and so on. Um, but I don't think what we're, well, my position is that uh, consultation currently takes place with the various sectors for the particular right. sector represented. So, right. so faculty, absolutely, consultation with our faculty caucus leader, maybe with the PSC, students, with student government, and others. And for the general campus, for instance, the external person that we're attempting to put here would be the campus president and maybe the foundation board and so on. I would not see myself, if this is what we're trying to achieve, a role for governance in that. Governance, the governance role is for faculty representation and student representation. I don't know Thank if you, I've added I anything said, to the I table. I think you said what I was trying rather inartfully mm -hmm. to say. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And, and I think President Keyes is absolutely right. The faculty and the students don't expect to be consulted over who are the choice of administrators. We don't expect right. to be consulted over who are the choice of trustees. Right. But to the extent we're expanding this now to an external group, that is where we thought it's shared governance, that we should be consulted low <laughs> bar as it might be. I mean, I, well, I guess I don't understand I think that's just what's taking, the pushback to I, th I think that's just taking it too broadly. I mean, part of what we're hoping to do, I believe, I mean, so we have the trustees, we know that, and we're looking at some other external represent, representative who may have a significant interest in the campus, an alum, for instance, a foundation board member. I mean, I keep going back to that 
a significant foundation. So happens at my place now. The chair of my foundation is also an alum. So I would imagine that if I were not there and you were looking for a president, you might want to consult with whomever the president is and say, who might we bring in on this, who knows the college, who understands it? So I, I'm seeing that. I, and I don't see a role at all in that for, um, for either the students, necessarily, or, or the faculty. But, you know, but I do speak from the presidential point of view. I, Please. I want to get back to basics, OK? We have a search committee. The, ch uh, the chairman appoints the membership, right? The membership must currently be three tenured faculty members, a student representative, and two students. Two stu what? Two students. Two, stu two, stu yes. two student representatives. Yes. Right. And trustees. Yes, there will be trustees on the. On that, that's yes. so. So now it's like ten people, five trustees, three, two. This is an effort not to exceed ten, because two of the five can be a senior level administrator or a representative of, of the external constituency. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then we take a vote. We do, and we report to the chancellor, and the chancellor has the last word. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? So there is the possibility that a search can have only three trustees. Yes. I think part of this came from the chance of view that there were so many searches and only well, a limited number of trustees, and to be able to put five trustees on every search was becoming almost impossible to fill those five places. And I think that was the whole rationale well, behind I, I, why they opened it up yes. to external people that knew. Right. That. I understand that, but the event might have been an aberrational event in the sense that we didn't have so many vacancies at one time. And it was always up to five with including the two senior level administrators. So we've had searches where there have only been three trustees, right? Yes. And up to two. So th that combined group has always been five. All we're doing is now allowing that combined group to potentially be, to Trustee Gribitz's point, it could be two trustees now, two administrators. Right, but remember administrator. the administrators are a fairly recent change. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's only in the last few years. So it had been just trustees at a certain point and no administrators. Um, I think it may be 2015. It's fairly recent that that change was done. I, I'm not looking but, for but more I could, work. But, I, but I, if you were appointed by the governor and the mayor, yeah. and under the uh, stat pardon me, I'll, no, I'll no. wait for you to get under the, the statutes that creates us, the trustees run the show with the, uh, where we have the ultimate responsibility. And I'm just, uh, you know, it's like a dilution of a, re of a statutory responsibility. No, I, I agree, but I, to trust the uh, Case. point, is, is where, I, I think I was part of the, I was on one of the search committees, and I couldn't go to all the meetings. Okay, I, I understand. Was, I, it was well, incredibly you know. labor intensive, okay. and they were like desperate to have a certain yes. number of trustees, <clears throat> so there was a real practical problem. Right. But it could, under this new configuration, it can be reduced to three, not more, not not more than three, not to be uh, available. Could it be reduced to two? No, I don't think so. I, I think it could actually. Oh, wait, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. looking at the language. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, you could. You could be down to one trustee. Thank you. Yes. So, okay. I just but then, no. It but says it, it ensures a minimum of three appointed trustees. It says here in the language. Where is it? Uh, Which paragraph? In the open, in the first the summary mm -hmm. page. Uh, Maybe it's ensure a minimum of three appointed trustees. It's good to have a college president on the committee. Well, this that could be one of the administration committee. Pardon? 
I was trying to be funny. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. I, I take everything so seriously, Trustee yeah, Gilbert, especially when I'm talking to trustees. <laughs> Yeah, but it, I don't think it says that. I don't think that says that in the right. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a summary, but it's not in here. Right. right. It's not in the actual guideline. It's in the explanation. So that's. Right. It I needs to be put in. It should be in the guidelines. I think it needs to be. Should be in the guidelines, not the explanation. But the explanation should yes, it should be in there. Yeah, it doesn't say it has to be three. Yeah, I don't see we're, it. we're not seeing it. It's only it's in, in the, the summary of the resolution on the cover page. It's in the, the preamble. Yeah, yeah, it's not in the legal. resolution. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, well, I, actually, there's a school of thought that says it does. That's intent. Yeah. Yeah, but we if we don't have to work, rely but, on intent. But, but, but if you take a line and put it in the rule, right. it's That's much right. better. That's yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So. Which is why we like Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Is this ready for a not just in the consultation? Uh, to I, my I, I mind, I think so. Does not mean I mean, you have a vote. What, what I will say no, about no, not looking for a vote. Is, but let's, let's just, just if if I, I actually think that this both. does say that it has to be at least three trustees because and the the, the paragraph that says senior level administrators and what or representatives third paragraph of external constituencies, two. right? Mm -hmm. right. So it's up to two. Administrators and/or external constituencies. So, and the total number of trustees, and other, and those and and those other two must be five. So, no, it says shall not exceed five. Right, but but um, but the point is, doesn't say it two has to be. people. Two people. You can have of the group of administrators right. and external constituencies. You can have a, up to two. Right. So in other words, there couldn't be fewer than three trustees on the committee. No, no, what there I'm saying is, is I agree with you with the two, but what I'm saying is up in the trustee section it says up to five. No, I so see why don't, no, why I don't see, we? And I then it says, you're, reading, it's, it. you're what, reading the second part saying up saying. to two, you're but saying. what I'm saying is the first part doesn't say has to be a minimum of five, less so, that so, number down no, below. So, so why don't we inject somewhere external constituents? There shall be, we, we can use plain English, there shall be at least three trustees. If, if we sure. just inject that sure. there should be a minimum of Absolutely. three yeah. trustees, yep. but right. can be sure. a maximum of five. Yeah, if we yeah. just right. inject yeah. that yeah, language, it's ambiguous. You could read we sure. could solve yeah. that problem. OK, and that, and that um, somebody will offer that. It's done. I offered it. <laughs> OK. I'll second it. For, for, <laughs> for, for, I'm beginning to think we're married. Are <laughs> 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 you at the hips? <laughs> yes. Uh, are we talking about paragraph two? Are we talking about paragraph three, Trustee Griffiths? What? Amending paragraph three? Yes. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to specify three trustees. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Whoever made the motion, do you accept the amendment? Yes, I do. Okay. I did make the motion. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the issue of consultation is dead issue? What? Are we doing that as separate issue? Well, what are we doing? The consultation. Consultation. The, uh, to my mind, <clears throat> using plain English, uh, consultation means what it is. You can, you can give your opinion. You don't have a vote. Right. 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 That's it. We just want to see the word. But I think there is but consultation right. already that, that happens it, at the campus. And right. It's, it's, All right. But, uh, it, uh, and it needs, and it, it's, this can't be done without it. So I, Jane, I, I, I is it the uh, Please. Is, is, it, is there a concern that the, uh, that the faculty as a whole may want an opinion at a campus? Yeah, specific to uh, I think the concern is that it's not really I, I think that the system has consultation as, as President Key said the faculty the governance is consulted uh, uh, to, to get the faculty members on the committee the governance is consulted to get the students on the committee and that the campus as President Key said it can be the president the cabinet others senior folks at the campus and that starting to say more about consultation, I think could suggest that there's additional formal governance consultation that really isn't necessary. So yeah. what words would you suggest to clarify? 
um, I think I don't think it needs clarification because I think that it's clear that there has to be consultation to get the faculty and the students with governance, and that that th th this is I think it's clear that the campus is consulted about uh, these the, about the other um, you know the senior administrators and the uh, and the uh, and the external constituencies. Where does, I, I'm not, I guess, Jane, to that point, I'm not following where that campus consultation even exists. I mean, I understand exactly what President Keyes was saying, but let's take, for example, the, the senior level administrators, forgetting for a moment this whole issue of external constituents. I mean, where does it say, you know, how the, the senior level administrators are being chosen? We know that most of the time it works that they call the president and they ask, et cetera, but arguably it doesn't say that anywhere. I think what is, a, at least, the way I perceive what's going on, you, you're, not, you're a different entity, okay? In other words, there's another entity that can be consulted. The faculty, the senior administrators, the trustees, now the, quote, the union. <coughs> well, that. Leave out the union. Oh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. But that's an entity. And you're well, thinking that the chancellor's thinking that's a slippery slope, there may be other entities? Well, there's also, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is, there's certainly consultation specified in the procedures, which is at the bottom of page two, that's with respect to the report for the search committee, you know, indicating needs and priorities. Um, so there's certainly, uh, that consultation, you know, is, is specified. Um, then, then would you please review those areas so that we have complete clarity on this um, on this proposal, even though it is not being changed? I, I think you make a good point, Jane. At the bottom of procedures where it says the chancellor will designate someone to confer with the appropriate constituencies, I mean, it's already suggesting that the faculty and other elected governance leaders, et cetera, are being consulted in some way about the shape of the search. I don't, don't think, honestly, that that's occurring right now beyond faculty for faculty, students for then students. That's a different issue from this. Right. Yeah, this is very right. different. This is about this is different. identifying the priorities of right. the college. Right. And it would be very appropriate. You can't do that without consulting that's all right. of them. My thought was, and I guess maybe my thought slightly different from Kay's, and I suppose this indicates that there may be some division of opinion amongst the faculty and some... Um, I mean, this is a new thing for us. And we're also, you have to understand, you know, we're mired in tradition, so it's very difficult for us to pull ourselves out of that. But um, I, I think there is a, um, when I think of campus consultation and, and why I don't think it's um, necessarily uh, unrelated to governance, at every campus there is a governance body that represents the entire college. Uh, even if there's a faculty senate, there's still a college council or something of that nature that represents everybody, students, senior level administration, um, the faculty, and so forth. And um, it seems to me that, you know, if I was doing a search and, and, it, and I had control over this sort of thing and was putting people together for a search for a president of, say, Kingsboro, I would go to that body, the college council, and I would say these are the people we're thinking, you know, including on the search. When you, when, when if there. I were doing that, and I would say, these are people we're thinking of doing, the implication is, and if you think differently, tell me. That implies a different process that's not specified here. Would you enlighten me on your thinking there? Well, that doesn't mean that they take a vote at the college council. It's an informational item. It can be, there can be discussion. Um, it doesn't mean that the council has any kind of veto power over what... So that's a different bar. That's consultation. That's consultation. That's, that's, consultation. that's what we're asking. We're not asking for a vote. Oh, no one was suggesting it. No right. I mean. But that's how we understand the word consultation. That's the way it's generally played out at the campuses. Oh. And when the campus consults, that's how we have understood campus consultation. Oh. Now, of course, it can be... It's a very loose term. The president can, cons can be consulted, and that can represent the campus. In fact, the President is the representative of the campus. I'd be willing, I don't know how Kay feels, I would be willing myself, I'm speaking for myself at this point, um, to accept campus consultation with the understanding that that might not always be 
um, a discussion in front of a college council or something of that nature. But I do think that it gives a college an option of doing that, and I think that's a good thing. I don't think that this kind of discussion is ever a bad thing. So I would recommend that. Well, I, I am pretty confident that the chancellor feels that there's a lot of engagement. I, I really think the way President Keyes expressed it is, I, I don't need to reiterate it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's appropriate engagement with appropriate sectors in the way it works. <clears throat> Um, you know, I suppose it's possible that we could put on, on the first page, um, there's, <coughs> there's the process, which is the second mm -hmm. paragraph. Right. When we say we could add, and the campus, in other words, when a vacancy occurs or is certain to occur, the chairperson of the board shall, after consultation with the chancellor and the campus, establish a search committee to seek a new president. I honestly don't think that's necessary because I think that happens already. Um, and I think that the problem is if you add this, I think you get folks who think that there may need to be consultation with the college council or the governance, which you know it is, is not the typical way that it's done except with respect to the particular constituencies. So you know, I think that it's... Um, I think it's it's try, it's informalizing something. I think it could it could create more discord by folks who think somehow they're entitled to something that it, they're really really not entitled to. So I think it's I think it's problematic. Um, I think it's that there is consultation about the committee, and I think the more the more thorough consultation happens in terms of the needs and the priorities. And, th and that's very clear that there's, you know, lots of participation for that um, and, and to set that, to, to, to take the temperature of the campus. And that seems to me the right place for that, to go into those other places. So that's what I would suggest that we correct the issue of the minimum of three trustees and that we leave this issue alone. That would be my suggestion. We're not gonna We'll withdraw it. I mean, I think we don't want to go to the mat on this. This isn't the end of. This isn't a big chit for us. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, we recognize all, that we all understand there should be and involvement think, and engagement. Yeah. So. I think the big issue is, and, and President Keyes might be the opposite example of this. It varies so dramatically across campuses. I mean, some presidents go out of their way to engage their faculty, to have conversations, etc. And other <clears> presidents, <throat> unless you show it to them and you say. Here's the requirement. They don't do it. I mean, President Keyes is a perfect example of the opposite. I visited her campus. She said, please come in, sit down, talk with me, tell me what the issues are. That's not always the case for us. So that's why it's probably hard for a president who does a good job of it to maybe recognize that it doesn't happen anywhere else. I, so, have, I have flaws elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll pull back. It's not the end of the world for well, us. Well, then, it, 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 then it's a good thing we had this conversation because yeah, it had yeah. some some clarity to everybody's understanding of how this should work. And I'm certain that from this meeting, uh, somebody will send a memo <laughs> that says, you really ought to think about doing this. And that would accomplish pretty much the same thing. Um, there is an amendment to the motion on the floor. Right. right. Let's vote on that first. Right. Yes. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There is a motion on the floor as amended, and it's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Now we're ready to go <laughs> to amendments to the Charter for Governance of Hunter College, 1B2. Anybody want to talk about that? I don't know if there are any Hunter representatives here. Yes. Want to discuss? Yes. I think there's someone here. Uh, here. Well, does well, it? Does yeah. it? You know, does it need a presentation? I mean, no. I think this is very. We've seen it all. It, you know. It, yeah. Very clear. And are we okay and, on uh, it? Yeah, we're good. With it. Yeah. Motion. So moved. Second. Second. There is no controversy on this. All in favor? Aye. Passes. Thank you very much. Governance plan for Lehman College, which is essentially the. Same level of uh, change. Mm -hmm. Right. Just keeping the number at 12. <laughs> Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any conversation on this? 
Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. The amendment passes. Um, and I'll ask uh, Vice Chancellor Waters to present uh, the following three items as a group. Um, we have three naming opportunities to consider, representing gifts to the university to totaling $1.6 <coughs> $1 million. The Hanalore S. and Robert M. Block Commons at Hunter College. The Elizabeth Hermerdinger Screening Center, also at Hunter College. And the Dina Axelrad Perry Pool at Queens College. The Block Commons is a student study area with the Silverstein Success Center in Hunter's Library, which is being named for the Blocks in recognition of a $500,000 gift to the Hunter College Foundation. The Hammerdinger Screening Center is also located in the Silverstein Success Center in Hunter's Library and is being named in recognition of a $100,000 gift. The Dina Axelrad Perry Pool is being named in honor of a member of the Queens College Foundation Board of Trustees who has pledged $1 million to the college. These naming opportunities have been reviewed and approved by both the Office of the General Counsel and the University's Office of Institutional Advancement. And so I present items 1B4, 1B5, and 1B6 for your consideration. Is there a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion on this? Hearing Thank none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. These are Thank passed. You. And now I'll ask Vice Chancellor Waters to move on to the Chancellor's University report. Uh, thank you. Um, we have six appointments to consider on the Chancellor's University Report, which I will present as a group. They are Item 1C1, appointment of Ann Lopes as Interim Provost and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Dr. Lopes is a tenured professor of political science at John Jay and has served as Associate Provost for Strategic Initiatives and Dean of Graduate Studies since 2013. She has more than 25 years of experience in higher education administration, graduate and professional studies, and international studies and programs. Item 1C2 is the appointment of Reza Fakari as Vice President for Workforce Development and Strategic Community Partnerships at Kingsborough Community College. Dr. Fakari has spent more than 12 years at Kingsborough as both Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Associate Provost. He garnered national recognition for Kingsborough's honors program and has successfully grown the college's Phi Beta Kappa chapter to one of the largest in the country. Under his direction, the college received grant funding to create a new student union and intercultural center. Dr. Fakari also created Kingsborough's <coughs> Equity in the Borough campaign, which engages industry and business partners to provide opportunities to reduce economic and educational disparities in underserved communities. Item 1C3, appointment of Niriata as Niriata Seals as Interim Vice President for Student Affairs at LaGuardia Community College. Dr. <coughs> Seals has served as LaGuardia's Pleasure. Associate Dean for Student Access and Achievement since November of 2016 and was previously Assistant Dean for Student Affairs. She has more than 15 years of experience in higher education administration, including leadership positions at Silverman School of Social Work and Hunter College. Gateway Academy at the City College of New York and DeVry Institute of Technology. <coughs> Item 1C4 is the appointment of Gregory Mosher as Professor of Theater at Hunter College with um, a waiver of Section 6.2B of the Bylaws. Gregory Mosher is an internationally acclaimed Tony winning director and producer of more than 200 stage productions on and off Broadway at Lincoln Center and Chicago's Goodman Theater. Great Britain's Royal National Theater, and London's West End. He has taught at a number of impressive institutions, including Juilliard, Columbia, and Yale, but has never earned tenure. Mr. Mosher's appointment represents a high-profile addition to Hunter College's theater department and to the university. It is therefore requested that Section 6.2B of the bylaws be waived, granting Mr. Mosher immediate tenure without having been previously tenured at another institution. Item 1C5 is the appointment of Carla Shedd as Associate Professor of Urban Education at the CUNY Graduate School and University Center with a waiver of Section 6.2B of the bylaws. Dr. Carla Shedd is currently an Assistant Professor at Columbia University in the Departments of Sociology and African American Studies. Considered a rising star in her field, she has received doctoral and postdoctoral fellowships to support her research, including awards from both the Ford and Mellon Foundations, and is the author of an award-winning book. The awarding of immediate tenure is integral to enticing her to leave Columbia, and therefore the Graduate Center requests a waiver of the previous tenure requirement in Section 6.2B of the bylaws. 
And lastly, the appointment of Jacqueline Clark as Vice President for Finance and Administration at Megar Evers College. Ms. Clark has served at Megar for the past year as Interim Vice President for Finance and Administration and previously held the title of Assistant Vice President of Finance and Administration. She has 25 years of experience within the CUNY system and an extensive background in finance and administration, facilities, buildings, and grounds. The presidents of the colleges strongly recommend these appointments. I therefore, therefore present items 1C1 through 1C6 for the committee's consideration. Is there a motion on items 1C1 through 1C6? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion on any of these items? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. The items pass. Thank you. Now I'll ask uh, uh, you to recognize that section two appears for informational purposes only. Uh, there is a new section to a justification, which is, uh, I think, something that we, should, we all should, uh, should know when people present their, uh, their credentials. But this looks uh, uh, terrific. But again, it is for information. Finally, I will ask Dean Arlene Torres to take us through the final item on our agenda, the quarterly faculty diversity report. <coughs> Good evening. So I'd like to begin this evening's conversation on diversity and inclusion by thanking key members of the CUNY community for launching critical conversations leading to concerted action. Chancellor Milligan, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Rabinowitz and Vice Chancellor Waters are working strategically to respond to ongoing concerns about the recruitment and retention of faculty and staff at CUNY. And the Board of Trustees, and this committee in particular, has challenged the CUNY administration and the campuses to be more transparent and accountable for institutional change. The annual affirmative action plans for 2015 and 2016 have served this past year as key data points for the development of quarterly reports on diversity presented to the Chancellery, the CUNY Board of Trustees, and the general public. And the data presented is instructive. It provides us information on the status of the workforce, hires, market availability, and underutilization at CUNY by gender, ethnicity, and race, with additional information about disability and veteran status for each campus by rank and academic program. And comparative analyses are underway to pinpoint persistent problems and to identify areas where progress has been made. And we are currently uploading data for the 2017 Affirmative Action Plan as well as the Italian American Plan to further advance our analyses and, plan and um, plans for actions in the future. The reporting process this past year has helped us to understand the need for better information systems, training, the collection, interpretation, and dissemination of data points, both quantitative and qualitative, that can help us to promote change. Earlier this month, for example, the Office of Recruitment and Diversity convened a group of 80 deans, department heads, faculty, and chief diversity officers committed to working together to provide training on the search, recruitment, and hiring process and to access available resources to diversify the applicant pool and the professoriate at CUNY. Challenges abound. There are multiple strategies underway centrally and across the campuses to retain our faculty, but they also need to be bolstered if CUNY is to address faculty separation and attrition. What this report does today is it provides an executive summary, and it is comprised of two parts, the current status of the faculty workforce, and secondly, the underutilization of faculty by academic fields for race, ethnicity, and gender for each college. And what I would like to do now is to go through 
the report that you have available. Um, it has some charts, but it also has some detailed numerical information as well as percentages so that you can see the comparison between 2015 and 2016. Someone, I presume, is flipping the pages. Right here. Electronically, good. Yes. Uh, and you also have a paper copy if that's more convenient. So among the minority full-time faculty. Are you, could you just describe the page you're on? On page two. Thank you. Which is also on the, on the screen. <clears throat> Among the minority full-time faculty, CUNY experienced modest numerical gains. From 2015 to 2016, the number of full-time faculty of color increased by 26 for a total of 2,594, or 34.5% of the full-time <laughs> faculty. You'll note that there is near parity by gender despite the numerical decrease of females by 28. And Italian Americans, a protected class at CUNY, decreased numerically by 10. If we turn now to, the, to page three, it provides you a comparison of full-time faculty by race and ethnicity from 2015 to 2016. Increases in the Asian American and Hispanic categories are observed and the black, African-American, Italian-Americans, and whites have experienced a numerical decline. Across all groups, the percentage change is small, given the decline in overall full-time faculty of 72. Page four demonstrates, again, in chart form, a near parity between males and females, and the number of males, though, has declined by 44, and the number of females by 28. If we turn to page five, and we look at the part-time adjunct faculty, as compared to the slight decrease among full-time faculty, as I said earlier, by 72, the total part-time um, adjunct faculty has increased by 312. Minorities increased by 114 and females by 180 over the past year. And I would like you to note that the percentage of minority adjuncts is currently at 38.2 percent, a 3.7 uh, percentage points above the full-time minority faculty percentage of 34.5. If you turn to page six, again, we have a visual that helps us to compare the number and percentage by race and ethnicity. And while there have been numerical gains, the percentage for each group remains stable. In the following slide, as noted for the full-time faculty, there is again near parity between males and females. On page eight, we provide you with information on the current status of full-time and part-time faculty who are veterans or identify as individuals with disabilities. And I want you to note that we were not able to provide that information to you uh, two years ago, but at present we are um, collecting that information. And is that collection undertaken manually or? The collection is undertaken manually. Mm -hmm. well, I'll ask more about that later. <laughs> okay. uh, if we move now to the uh, new hires, this helps to contextualize the current status of the faculty that I just referred to. As compared to the previous year, 193 minority faculty were hired representing 43.6% of the hires, and Italian-American hires increased as well. Females comprised 58.2% of the hires in 2016-2017, so there has been um, a shift in the, um, in the number of females relative to their male counterparts. On page 11, we drill down even further 
and we compare both the numerical and percentage change of full-time new hires from one year to the next. And 43.6% <coughs> again of the new hires are minorities as compared to 38.9% the previous year. And so there is slight improvement there. This is again uh, the demonstration of the, of the parity between males and females. On page 13, as I noted in my opening remarks, we're working to enhance the affirmative action plans to better inform action-oriented programs. And so page 13 and 14 provide information on areas where changes have either been implemented or are underway. So as we uh, roll out the 2017 affirmative action plan, we expect to, to be able to better provide data that will um, enhance the development of the quarterly reports, but that will also allow us to better see changes both in the short, short term and longitudinally. We are also providing additional training as a result of these changes over the course of the summer that we expect will also result in improvement in the affirmative action plans. What I want to turn to now is our faculty underutilization report. And that is not on a PowerPoint, but that is in the information that you have um, in your handout. The faculty underutilization report by academic program shows the change in underutilization reported in the 2015-2016 plan. And what you'll note, if you turn to uh, the first page as an example of architecture and related services, that the green indicates a move in a positive direction the red in a negative direction, interesting. and the blue is indicative of underutilization. And rather than provide you with an analysis of each chart, what I've decided to do is to focus on the professoriate and note general areas of concern in a number of academic fields. And in the interest of time, I'd just like to review a couple of them. So for example, if you look at the utilization of academic programs for architecture and related services. On the top part, I have written in a commentary. And you'll note that CCNY, for example, experiences underutilization among females across all race and ethnic groups and among total minority. And underutilization has increased among Hispanics and for total minority. Mm -hmm. While females and black African Americans remain underutilized, there has been some improvement. And you'll note the green. New York City College of Technology, for example, experiences underutilization among females, and black African Americans remains constant, and that's why you see the blue um, indicated there. Arlene, I'm sorry, just to make sure I'm, I'm reading this correctly. If we just look at this first page mm -hmm. and we look at City College and female, you're saying that they have nine, they should have five more, or they should have five? What, how, five how am I reading that? They should have five more. They should have five more given the current size of the department or given, labor given the labor market? Given the labor market. Labor given the availability. So, so, Okay, so then in terms of the mix of the existing department, it should be proportionally not five more faculty, but five of the existing faculty that are male should be female. Correct. Right? Okay. And then the one indicates that they went one positive in that direction That's correct. last year, and going across under Hispanic, they went down two. Right. That's correct. I just want to make sure I'm reading it correct. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Clear on it. So if we turn the page and look at area, ethnic, cultural, gender, and group studies, you'll note that five CUNY campuses are underutilized for females. Yes, it's the next page. It's the next page. It's two of 36. 
Underutilization has increased for females on three campuses and decreased in three. And five campuses experienced underutilization for Asian Americans in this field as well. Hunter College, for example, has improved its level of underutilization among females and Asian Americans. However, its level of underutilization <coughs> remains steady for black African Americans and has increased for Hispanics and total minority. I have another question. Yes. How are you um, dealing with the fact that at some of the colleges, you know, these categories don't represent departments and whatnot? Because I'm, I'm looking, for example, at, at BMCC. We have um, an ethnic and cultural affairs, which is sort of a subset of social science, because later on you get to history and different things. It's headed by a Hispanic woman, and yet I'm reading zeros under female, so I'm not really, how do you do that when these don't fit these categories? Okay. Um, each college makes the decision on how they're going to um, create these categories, mm -hmm. and they um, will blend different departments to create a particular category. In the case of BMCC, where it, it's noted as zero, it is because if the number of faculty is less than five, we cannot report it. Okay. So what we indicate is, is zero. Okay. Even though you may have five or less, and in that group you may have a Hispanic faculty member or an African American faculty member, but you'll see that across the board we have indicated zero because of the small number. So if it's less than five for, throughout this report for any department, it's going to come up as zero? That's correct. And then how do you come up with the underutilization if there's zeros? Like the fact that underutilization also can be a zero? In, is that the case everywhere? So there may be an instance where a faculty, where there was a department where there were six faculty members last year, and now there are five. And we have to report them this year as zero, but they lost one. Right, I can understand the change column. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense to me, the one and the two. What I don't understand is how you get an underutilization number, or maybe you don't, maybe it is zero, I haven't looked all the way through. So is every time the first column is zero, the second column has to be zero? Mm -hmm. It should be. Unless there's a typo. So it is zero, zero. Yeah. That's my question. And, and bear in mind, we're, one of our challenges is these are all manually entered. And we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> the BMCC, oh, they have 73 people in social science, and they could have put those people in social science. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask? I, I just don't understand. I just don't know how useful all this is uh, from my perspective. I mean, I don't know that I need to know all this. This right. seems to be stuff that should not be at the board level. And I just question, where do you, you say you have to report on this? Is this regulations from somewhere? Or is it, I mean, like, it, can you lump sum this all together and give an overall view of what's happening? I just don't know if you need this much granularity, but maybe that's what you're required to report on. But especially since each college seems to make their own decisions on who goes in what category, seems like you're you know, it's apples and oranges, and it's not consistent well, we, across the. We universe. might as well have that conversation now about manual, yeah. um, <clears throat> because I think it would add something to the answer to a very legitimate question. The, the general answer is: I asked for this when I first became chairman. We don't do this. We got to begin to look at how we're recruiting staff, how diverse our faculty is. We keep on. Um, pounding our chests about how diverse our student body is. In fact, those are the numbers turned inside out uh, on this. And there's got to be a, something you can do about that. Um, and part of it is reporting numbers and beginning to ask questions behind those numbers. Now to the observation about the manual collection. I've been troubled by this for a very long time. In a university such as this, when we are still doing this manually, is otherworldly. I, I can appreciate tradition, but this takes it to a, to a very silly extreme. Um, but the other 
part is, is also troubling. When you do it manually, what if there are computational errors manually? Easily. Easily. And they are easily made. <laughs> Who can catch all of them? Mm -hmm. Like it's this group of people mm -hmm. who has to catch them, which leads me to, to really lack some confidence in not the integrity of the data, that's too strong a, a term, but lack confidence in our ability to report these things clearly and accurately because of the, um, because of the uh, deficiencies in our own IT uh, readiness. That's a problem. That they have to collect, every time we have a report. I think it's ridiculous. That they have to do this uh, manually is nuts. Yeah, I agree. It's an expenditure of, of, uh, of time and effort um, when we should be pressing a button and getting this stuff. Getting but, also, but also it leads us to, to, to make some errors. Uh, and that's not right. So, so what the hell is going on here? I mean, it's, I'm finding this bizarre, you know, and obviously, and I agree with Jill, it's not the best use of our time, mm -hmm. but that's the least important. It's just, it's this 1970s way of collecting data. What are we going to do about it? I don't know who to look at. You know. Can you elaborate a little on this manual? Where does the data come from? So the campuses actually put together their reports every year. We give them, and, and I'm, I, I have stepped away from it a little bit, so maybe Ann and, and um, Arlene can talk a little bit about it, but we give them the, the labor market data, and then the campuses actually compare their workforce to the labor market, and they come up with these underutilization numbers. It's required as part of the uh, federally uh, mandated affirmative action plan. The campuses also complain about the amount of time it takes to do this manually. We would, we are looking at ways to utilize information that's in CUNY first, but as you know, Information in CUNY First is not always as pristine as it should be in order to be able to produce reports. But you know, we could, we've been working with the campuses to clean up the data. But we also, the actual computation of the labor market versus the workforce is not something that automatically comes out of CUNY First. It requires a special software package. So that's kind of where we are at this point, trying to work with cleaning up the data, but then also trying to see if we can buy a software package that will produce these reports at the I, press of yep. I guess I'm struggling with the, this is so onerous time after, I mean, manual makes no sense to me, but, and I get the CUNY first issues, but essentially we hired 400 faculty last year. We lost 400 faculty last year mm -hmm. across 24 campuses. So those are the only 800 records that should have been changed from the previous year. Like it shouldn't be this time consuming project beyond those changes, right? I mean, I'm just talking now about the professoriate. There's promotions, there's tenure. Oh, in terms of the, yeah. moving them into different categories right. yeah. for us, but in the broader sense of the professoriate, right? That's yeah, but you still have to look at your workforce. You have to take a snapshot of what your workforce looks like today, as you, you and this is truly a snapshot when we do it, um, and see where people are. And as Anne said, that people move, they, we, we characterize them differently, or we put them in different buckets if they are an assistant professor versus a full professor. So there's, you know, there's analysis that has to be done. And then people leave. Um, and then there's a whole um, calculation about whether people have been promoted, and, and that has to be looked at separately, too. But there is software out there that will do it. And with information technology that permits, that, that, that befits the, um, the uh, century in which we find ourselves. Uh, it might be a nice idea to begin to acquire that and, and, and do that so as not to waste people's time on an otherwise very important thing that's to know the about our universe. The problem is it really is important. Yeah, right. And, and can it be centralized? It seems to me like if you had a software package, you know who you hire or buy, or you know, you, it all comes through your office. So should, does the campuses really need to do this? It seems like this could be at a central place where you know where everyone's moving around. If you had a software package that, you know, you, the, the data, you could control the data in yeah. and then control the data out and not get into all, you know, 24 campuses with multiple people inputting data that may be wrong or not wrong, uh, right? You know, like, is that I'd is love that to possible? be able to do that through using CUNY, CUNY first. 
because if the information, for the hiring goes, play, goes on at the campus. I mean, that's, but if they enter the data into CUNY first, we should be able to then consolidate and get information out of CUNY first that would allow us to It requires a bigger effort than, we're, than we can discuss here. Right. right. <laughs> But, 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 but it's good that you know that. But to the other point about granularity, and I think we should be asking the questions, and to Trustee Sunshine's point, it's important information as well. I don't know that we need to see by discipline, by campus. I mean, I, I think we could start with a bigger picture, sort of where do we have issues by campus, and then maybe tackle one campus at a time and tell us what you're doing about that one campus, because this is just reams of... Of tiny data. Well, let, let me let me disagree with you. Okay. Um, I really believe this is important because, for example, when the last time we had a report such as this, we discovered that there were what about a dozen um, um, departments across the university that had zero diversity. Mm -hmm. right. Zero representation. Nobody. Zero. Right. Like, how does that happen in New York? Um, Although you realize these categories don't line up with departments. That's our concern. Yeah. These the problem is, like as a department it's chair, yeah. it's very hard to use this kind of thing. And it makes me wonder about the underutilization numbers I get from my college. Mm -hmm. you know, are they accurate? Because nothing here lines up with the way we compartmentalize things. Right. No, no, not quite, because there is consultation on each campus around how you decide. I mean, for instance, I was fine with architecture. We don't have it. So zero, zero, yeah, no, zero, we, we, zero. We well, yeah. um, And there is one later on, computer science, and then there's one computer science engineering, computer science statistics. When I looked at it, I saw zero, zero, zero. But then I realized we were put on the statistics side rather than the engineering side. So there is discussion, though, on the campus uh, to decide if you have a bit of an anomaly department, where might it go? All right? At the community colleges, they're all anomaly departments. No, 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 Pretty no, much. no. I, I lived my life in community colleges, and I was even affirmative action at Queensboro. So, no, that's not true. I mean, there, well, I, I, I respect yeah. the fact that there are some unusual departments, but they can be worked through. I mean, we can agree to disagree, and we can also agree that there will be well, some differences. Can you give a simple example here? Yeah, sure, of course. The, if you look at history in Kingsborough, it says zero. We have a history of philosophy and political science. Right. That there are no philosophers according to this. There no, now they are in social science, but that's totally useless to me as a department chair because everybody's grouped into the social science, including the psychologists, the sociologists, and so on, who are in the behavioral department. It doesn't social science. Basically, what Kingsborough did was it threw everybody in social sciences. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, so broken so out. You know the interesting part of that. Is your own college's uh, affirmative action plan that mandates that? Mm -hmm. I guess that's I, something. That's the, one of the reasons why we discuss this in this granularity, because right. there are things that that can figure the data well before it gets to our eyes. I welcome the granularity. Yeah, and I would like to be able to use it uh, in terms of the hiring. Now we get figures from Kingsborough, um, but. Um, you know, it would be nice if there was a way to compare across campuses and things like that. That's what a report like this would help with. Um, and it does in terms of these broad categories. I guess, is, this, is it because of the labor market um, information? Is that why? Some of it is the way we get the labor market data, yes, is yeah. by discipline. Right. So, um, and, and to your point, departments here may be a mishmash of a lot of disciplines in one place. So that's part, that sure. is part of the issue. But, it, and, and we've had this conversation about searching. You know, to, this is only a place that you start. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're actually looking for somebody in philosophy at your school, then you're going to dig a little bit deeper because you want to know where the, the faculty of color are being produced, what universities are producing philosophers. And that information is available. So. This is just gives you a place to say, oh, I really need to pay attention to this, and then go a little bit further into the data about where, where should I be recruiting? How should I be reaching out? 
you know, can I establish partnerships with other institutions that are producing scholars in philosophy that maybe I can tap into? That's not, this is only gives you this place to say, aha, let me look at this further. But I guess to Trustee Ferrer's point, and I think he's right on the money, we identified, you had this report before, we said there were 16 where there were holes across the university. What I'd want to hear at the follow-up meeting is not this. What's the update on the 16? What's happened? What's, what are we doing? The interesting thing is the uh, chancellor appointed a task force. Yes, I know. President Robin. To look at that. Uh, I, some of that m might have changed. And at, at our next meeting when we discuss this, I will invite the both of those presidents to come mm -hmm. and let us and share with us their work because they should be working with us on a parallel track. Right. They're doing Absolutely. different things, Absolutely. but it's a parallel track. But for example, has that task force been apprised of here are the 16 areas where we have holes? Well, they're just getting well, started. We'll get, so yeah. Yeah. I happen to serve on it. Uh, we've had two meetings. We've been uh, gathering a lot of data. Uh, we've been getting consensus among ourselves. And yes, we will have something, absolutely. Jose Lucas Cruz, who's new to the University and Michelle Anderson, who's been around as uh, the dean of the law school, but is now at Brooklyn. They're leading us, and there are about six, seven, eight others of us on it. I they have access you. to what we have. Pardon? Oh, they have yes. access mm -hmm. to what we have. Oh yes. Oh, okay. good. <clears throat> we've been looking at it, and we're looking at some time frames and some plans, and potentially um, trying to get a projection over the next three, four, five years, given our budget. What are we likely to do? in the way of hires. And one of the things I think we'll also need to know is who are we likely to lose in terms of people who are at a certain age who may mm -hmm. retire. And so the committee is taking that, that task force is taking it very seriously, and I suspect we'll have something by the fall. Maybe I, uh, it may be good to continue with this report. Uh, I'd ask uh, Dean Torres to come to it rather quickly. And so that we could get some more questions. In. Mm -hmm. sure. So if you go to page 3 of 36 of the underutilization report and you look at biological and biomedical sci uh, sciences, um, it indicates that 10 CUNY campuses are underutilized for females um, in this area. And then if you look, five campuses continue to experience underutilization for black African Americans. And so if we're interested in bolstering the minority representation in the STEM fields, then the question that I would ask is, why do we continue to have this level of underrepresentation among a particular minority group and among females? And what can we do given um, our interest in advancing STEM to improve this? Right. So this is you know, kind of a follow-up question that I would ask given um, the data. If you turn to uh, page 6 of 36, if we look at business management, marketing, and support services, in there we, we have nine CUNY campuses that are underutilized for females in this area, and six campuses experience total minority underutilization, with the most underutilization among black African Americans. So there are nine campuses across the CUNY campuses that experience underutilization for African Americans. Again, I pose the question, if we are interested in advancing the number of minorities in the field of business, uh, marketing, management, and support services in the city of New York, then why aren't our numbers better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not only looking at uh, the numbers across the campuses, I'm also beginning to ask questions about what does this mean for our workforce and for the kind of training that we're providing to students if we don't have that diverse workforce. And it seems to me that the campuses, the department heads, and the deans and the provosts should be asking those questions when they look at this data as well. Mm -hmm. Arlene, let me ask you another question that we should be asking when we look at this data. When you go out into the marketplace and you look at business faculty across the spectrum, mm -hmm. where do we compete in terms of salary? I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? I'm saying when you go out into the workforce and you say people that have a PhD in business, mm -hmm. in terms of our ability to be competitive oh. and hire those people, where do we stand in the workforce? So that's a question yeah. that, the, that the department chairs need to have. Right. 
to ask those questions with um, with the deans and the provosts. If the salaries are such that we can't compete, then that conversation needs to be had. And, and there are deeper questions than that. Have we tried to compete in certain places? What's the way? I mean, th th there's a whole rubric of questions that are asked at moments like this, like mm -hmm. where do you go? How often do you go? Who do you reach out to? You know, there's a bunch of things. Right, no, no, I know that. But I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, when you say that's a question, let's assume we've asked the question. We know the answer. We're not competitive. We don't get the best candidates in certain disciplines because they're, you know, the numbers, et cetera. I mean, what's the next step? Well, those are some of the things, certainly, that we as a task force will be talking about. But I can certainly say to you that, you know, and maybe I'm in a very unique situation. You know, I'm out in Jamaica. Uh, I'm not in Manhattan. And so I feel as if, as a president, I can be competitive in my arena. I am not Baruch, for instance. And so I exercise. For me, some discretion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the faculty don't like it because mm -hmm. they want everybody to be the same. To hire a business professor at a different rate than I may hire an English professor. Mm -hmm. But that's a decision that we have to take because that's what the market bears. Mm -hmm. But it does mean kind of making some of those uh, discretionary decisions. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I have a unique situation because I'm not, you know, I'm in the middle tier kind of thing. So I can feel as if. For me, I can be competitive, but that might not be what Baruch might say or Hunter might say. They may have a different point of view. And it's recruiting. And it's a whole bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Please so on, proceed. On page 7 of, um, of 36, uh, with the focus on communication, journalism, and, and related programs, again, we noted that 10 campuses are underutilized for females. and. There is a negative trend in four campuses and a positive on one CUNY campus. While improvements have occurred in underutilization for total minority, there are some campuses that face particular challenges. And so again, we need to address, given the field of communication journal and journalism um, in a city like New York, how do we take a next step to improve um, the, the kind of training that we provide to our undergraduate and graduate students by having a diverse professoriate in the field of communication. And again, and you literally stick your hand out a window <laughs> in this city and find somebody. Find a journalist or find somebody find a journalist. with a doctorate or what's the Find a journalist. Do all our journalists have a doctorate? I, I warrant no. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be the best example, but we were hiring uh, That's what we're talking about now. Yeah. But um, since we require it. On page 9 of, of 36, if you look at computer and information sciences, utilization for computer, computer and information sciences, yeah. I was actually really pleased to see yeah. it's fairly robust. However, seven CUNY campuses are underutilized specifically for black African Americans. And then we see one campus, like Brooklyn College, is making strides in a positive direction. But, computer science and other things. Yeah, I guess on this one, I guess I want to say, because my first thought when I looked at this page was, wow, this is phenomenal. It's computer science, and that's competitive and hard. To, but then when you look at the category faculty, so many of them are zeros, meaning they're less than five, and you don't really have the data. Small. This right. It's very really small. You yes. have a small number. Sure. Yeah. So this isn't correct. Right, uh, in page 10 of 36, the field of education, underutilization for females has increased in three CUNY campuses, and nine campuses continue to experience underutilization for African Americans in education in spite of strides in a positive direction in five of these campuses. Now, that's a concern that in the field of education, we have that level of underutilization. Yep. And that's it's something that it seems to me, if we're educating the future educators, we need to think about um, how to strategically address this level of underutilization. Again, in New York, stick your hand out of the window. I, I want to make clear, I'm 100% with you on this concern about underutilization. Huh. 
I just don't think going through this on every page is is telling. Okay, you know, we've got underutilization. I'd rather we got to the, what are we doing about it? And oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and for HR to say, this concerns me, and these are the questions. We got that. We these concerns us, and these are the questions. We want you to help us with the answers. But, okay. but if I may, not everybody is as informed as the people here now, mm -hmm. because some of this information, even though it is available, it appears that it is not being presented routinely and regularly with our chairs. Uh, certainly, I know it. Uh, I question. Well, right. I certainly know I presented at PNB, right. and I'm not. I'm just saying. It, and, and of course, you have to engage with it regularly. In order and systematically, in order to even believe it, quite frankly, because somebody could look at this and say, "Oh no, no, no! My campus isn't like this at all. Come on, you guys got it wrong. Maybe I blame my affirmative action officer." But I think, you know, like uh, James Baldwin would, says, "Nothing can be changed unless it's faced." Uh, and so we've got to face. Some I think of you that. go back to another issue that we talked about earlier. On the other point is how things are handled from campus to campus sure, sure. vary greatly. Whether we're talking about this or any other topic, and that's where again I think mm -hmm. we need to from central say like, yeah, how is this being communicated? How are we making sure this is? That's a part of the point of this. Right. Okay. I also have to point out that this is this activity takes place at the campus on, at the department level. We've really got to get to those department chairs and provide them with the information and then give them the tools, you know, these are things that you can do. And that's going to vary from discipline to discipline. There's a, there's a lot of um, conversation that needs to take place. The faculty have to own this. Yeah, but that's to my point about translating this into something yes, that makes that's sense at the absolutely. campus level, because this doesn't make sense at a, for and, example, our campus and that's level. And that's fine. But that's why I'm saying that but yeah. you have to engage, but the faculty have to own it, too. And if you need more information, we can provide more information. Good. Yeah. Well, the faculty is kind of busy at the moment. I think this I, I don't even know busy. The well, faculty don't control some of these decisions well, about mean, the salaries. I think the faculty okay. cares a great deal about this. I know that they do in my department, and I have stressed this kind of thing in my department. Um, and uh, we certainly discuss it when we do hiring. But um, I think that there needs to be some sort of required translational process whereby what you're presenting here gets reinterpreted at at the campus level in such a way that it fits that actual campus, and then it needs to be a topic of discussion at the campus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Otherwise, a very good idea. You're not going to get any kind of buy-in, I think. Well, well I, think what we, I, I think what has been accomplished already is in the last uh, six or so weeks, Chancellor has appointed a presidential yep. level task force. Mm -hmm. OK, we're discussing it, mm -hmm. and we're beginning to measure it. We will continue to measure it, because in fact, that does provoke conversation about it. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get these numbers a little better mm -hmm. because we're going to look very, very carefully at how our technology is serving us or not serving us. Right. But I do think you do have buy-in and you do have support from faculty. I mean, I think this isn't a concern amongst the faculty. I know of no faculty on my campus. It's a concern of the trustee. Right. So. It's so, I think it's a concern natural, of this trustee. Yeah, it's a natural alliance, I think. So you can look at the comments that I've made in the remaining fields, but let me say something about some of the conversations that I've had with faculty members who have participated in the uh, diversity <coughs> dialogue that we've had. We, also, we conducted a survey, and we asked questions about their knowledge about this. There was very little knowledge about this. Over 50% of the faculty said they had never seen a search guide. Why not? There were faculty members who were search chairs, and they had never really carefully looked at the guidelines for an appropriate search. There were faculty members who had not looked at the multiple resources that are available if you want to recruit in a particular field and they used standard recruiting uh, sources, whether they were paper sources, they had never analyzed whether or not the money that they were spending on it was even effective. Well, I'm sure they're underinformed. <laughs> and so the challenge is 
uh, to be supportive and to indicate that yes, the central office has some resources and we are available to help, but the campuses also have resources and they have to take ownership of the process. And we have to encourage the ownership of the process at every level. Faculty governance is critical and, and faculty involvement in the searches is key. But those very faculty members have to be informed. They have to be really well informed and they have to get the support of their deans and their provosts and the presidents. And it seems to me there isn't enough communication and enough basic training on where the resources are to be effective. And this is a first step. But if I was looking at this, and in my life as a department head, I would look at this underutilization. And in my field of anthropology, I would say, well, what does the National Survey of Earned Doctorates say about the number of doctorates that have been produced nationally? And how does this compare to this? general category in the social sciences. And then I would look at the American Community Survey and I would see how many anthropologists have PhDs that are in the New York City area. I wouldn't just rely on this, there would be multiple sources. And I would use that to then make an argument to my faculty and say, this is the state of affairs. Yes, this is one tool, but this is giving us a broader picture of the availability of of anthropologists. Now let's go to the Association of Black Anthropologists. Let's go to the Association of Latino Anthropologists. Let's go to the Association of American Anthropologists and have a discussion about okay, this. Let me stop you right All now. Of that. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And we have heard faculty, and I'm just relaying what's been told to us. Yes, let's go to that convention where they're having such and such groups get together. And we've heard from Central, there's money available for faculty searches. And then when faculty do searches, they're told, no, there's no money available for the search. And you can't fly somebody in to meet with them. You can Skype them. You can Skype them. Oh, oh, over the, the whatever, <laughs> Skype them. You know what that means. I'm, I'm losing it here. But forget flying to a conference to start talking to junior faculty. It's not happening. Now, maybe it's happening at some campuses. Maybe it's happening at senior campuses. I don't know. At community colleges, it's not happening. Now, that, you know, at, at the same time, I look at this and I think, well, some of the community colleges are actually still doing a good job. And that's another aspect of this I would want us to examine because I would hate to think we're only hiring diverse faculty at our community colleges where we pay a whole lot less. I'd like to make sure we're hiring diverse faculty everywhere. But in terms of resources, I think you're right. I think we want to make sure that the faculty who are leading searches are well informed, et cetera. If you're polling the, the whole faculty and some of them say I'm clueless on this process, I'd say they've probably never served on a PMB, they've never been charged, or that last time they served was five years ago, et cetera. But I, we welcome this. But let's get something solid that shows these are the resources available so that I can put it in the hands of chairs and then they can go back to their presidents and say, I want this money to go to this conference to source these faculty. And when they say no, we'll come back to you and say, here's the campus. They got zero money for the search. Don't expect miracles to happen. Because that's what we hear from the faculty. Your point is well taken. Let's, let's continue before, uh, before we end up having breakfast. <laughs> um, so as I, um, as I indicated in my remarks, I mean, I think if we look at the remaining, uh, at the remaining fields, um, there are, uh, if you look, for example, uh, at some of the comments I made with respect to psychology, <laughs> uh, page 32 of 36, nine of the campuses are underutilized for females and five are underutilized for total minority. Now you do see that some strides have been made, but they're also, if you look at disaggregated data by race and ethnicity, there are challenges on several of the campuses. And psychology is one of those fields, yet again, that we need to take a closer look at what is happening in that field if consistently, not just from one year to the next, but over a five year span or over a seven to 10 year span where you have not seen substantive change in the number of diverse faculty in a psychology department. 
So this provides a tool for us to look at things as we compare from one year to the next, but it also sets the stage for us to look at longitudinal data over time. Mm -hmm. Let's, can I ask you a question about the psychology page again to make sure that I'm interpreting it correctly? Mm -hmm. When I look at this, the third column changed from 2015 to 16, and I see zeros. That basically says to me, we haven't hired any faculty. So if you're expecting the department to make a change from year to year, but we're not getting full-time lines to hire faculty, we can't make a change. Sure. And then I that see three boxes that are pink, which means we lost faculty. They left for one reason or another. Sure. So between all the zeros where the no faculty were hired and the three where they had people retire, leave, et cetera, no matter who owns this, we're not changing anything if we're not hiring full-time faculty. Absolutely. So, I mean, You're right. I think, I, and again, right. I've heard from several campuses where presidents have communicated the message that we want to do better on this, et cetera, and the faculty have said, fabulous, I have no open lines I can't hire. Don't tell me next year I haven't improved my numbers. Sure. If I don't hire someone, I can't change the numbers. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And assuming that you have no attrition. I, I'm saying attrition only worsens it. Even when we lose people, we're not necessarily replacing them. can't replace. Them. I have a question about the issue of attrition. Mm -hmm. um, it looked like from the initial pages there that we lost people, but we hired many more people than we had before. We hired like twice the number, almost twice the number in 2016, 17, than we did to 2015, 16, or whatever. That's correct. But we went down like 50 faculty or something right. like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we've lost ground. Right. Despite Correct. the fact that we're adding more, we actually mm -hmm. lost more ground than it looked like. If you just <coughs> subtract the numbers on that's the first page. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That, that is that's the essential observation. Right. Yes. So here's my question about that. Those people who are leaving, are they disproportionately minority women, things like that, or are they not? Uh, like, if I add up all the pink columns there, am I going to end up finding that the, because I didn't do that, I'm not that ambitious, but, yeah. So as we look at the separations, the number of faculty of color who are separating because of non-reappointment or because of resignation, and they haven't explained why they resigned, mm -hmm. is much greater among faculty of color than it is for their white counterparts. Can I ask another question? Can you give me some sense as to whether the non-reappointments are in the majority or whether the resignations are in the majority? And could the resignations be because they've gotten better offers elsewhere and they, do you have any way of knowing it? Uh, I don't. Yeah. And what we are trying to do um, now is we are conducting exit surveys to get a better sense of those resignations and their reasons for leaving the institution. And some may have indicated that they see the writing on the wall that they're not going to get non-reappointed, so they resign before that even takes place. Right, right. Yeah. So we've got multiple challenges. Right, right. Yeah, I think in, to Michael's question, I had a meeting with I think I had it with you, Arlene, a while back, and I asked that, that question, and Michael's hitting on, on the point. And when I did the math, our non-traditional or underrepresented faculty, you know, 40% resign, uh, resigned of the number compared to, you know, 29.2% for white faculty. And they retired at lower rates but resigned earlier and were not reappointed at almost double the rate. Mm -hmm. Correct. Which begs a whole other question. And we asked about this issue of exit interviews and we're told that they're not being done consistently across campuses, we're not getting that information, et cetera. So we have um, made the, the Chancellor's Working Group aware of this and they are extremely supportive of having exit surveys um, be required of all of the campuses. So that we get better at it. Yeah, it'd be good to know. We actually have the technology to do that. Oh. I mean, my sense of this, I, I was a grievance counselor for over 10 years. And I would say the disproportionate number of my cases were minority faculty. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. 
So this, this presents a window of opportunity, it seems to me. Just like we uh, always say that it's easier to retain a student if we can, That's right. if we have the early intervention, if we do professional development, if we do mentoring, you know, all of the things. If we're very clear about what the expectations are, and if we give solid guidance in the evaluation, including waking people up by saying, this is unsatisfactory, and here's what you have to do. But there is not really an appetite for doing that. I have to tell you, there's no appetite in general for doing that kind of work as colleagues. Look, I've been a colleague too. And so we get a very mixed message. And very often it's the president who's doing the evil deed, okay? And so we've got to get early intervention for everybody. By the way, some of the best white faculty could benefit from a good professional development program. So if we did a good professional development program for minorities, everybody who would come in would also benefit from it. So I think we've really got to, and I know the presidents and the task force, well actually this is my particular passion, and, and on the task force we're gonna pay attention to retention as well as recruiting in new folk. Yeah. And you know, this is a place where you know, I think we all want to make a better contribution. <clears throat> and we're okay. going to look at the crazy quilt of rules across this university, yeah. from department to department, from college to college, and see what makes sense. And maybe that's a place where the trustees need to get involved. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're raising a good point about how it varies from department to department and across campuses, but also in terms of the training that's missing here. I mean. <clears throat> Having come from the corporate world, the levels and amounts of training you'd have to go through as a manager, what you'd have to do, and then we do nothing, nothing comparatively here for department chairs who, they're not managers in the sense that they're not appointed by somebody else, they're elected by their peers, but at the same time, you're right, it's a colleague, it's uncomfortable, that's who elects them, but there should be some mm -hmm. better training about how to write an evaluation, et cetera. Having served on a faculty grievance uh, committee at, at my campus, I can recall situations where a file came up, someone was questioning the fact that they weren't being reappointed. If I had looked at what they had contributed to the campus, I would agree 100% they didn't warrant being reappointed. That didn't need to be four years down the line. That could have been after the second year. But the file had these very nice bland, doing a nice job, et cetera. And I said to the other people on the committee, recommend that we reappoint. Why, we all agree. I go, because they're going to grieve it, they're going to go to the union, and all the documentation they've been given says they're doing a great job. Life is good. I mean, so training is woefully missing. Yeah, it's not you should just put the, yourself on this committee. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, let me just say that in conclusion, we recognize some of this, um, but we also get a great deal of pushback because there are faculty governance issues. There are concerns about the central administration making recommendations as opposed to mandating certain kinds of um, uh, initiatives. And I take the position also as university dean that it's my responsibility to make sure that I work vigorously to retain the faculty and when I can't make the interventions with a department head, I teach my faculty how to um, engage proactively for themselves and how to look at, how to engage in activities, whether it's to the faculty uh, fellows publication program or the Mellon grant or professional development. Um, and those, we have very limited resources in the central office to do that. And we only, we only manage to, to support you know, 50 to 60 faculty. How wonderful it would be if we supported them across the CUNY campuses to engage in that level of, of mentorship and support. <clears throat> and I ask myself every day, why not? Why shouldn't the campuses and why shouldn't the central administration partner to have that level of mentorship, I think retention would be a very different story. So let me suggest that for our next discussion of this, there be a fuller analysis of 
uh, the issues we've discussed, what we need to be thinking about and proposing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I suspect to you, uh, Trustee Ferrer and others, that uh, that task force may be very well ready yeah. to be at the next meeting, which would be September, mm -hmm. to give this group an idea of where we're going and to get some endorsement possibly or maybe even to expand the ideas. I, I'm quite sure that. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. There are two very credible leaders and yep. as long as they've got you there, uh, <laughs> no. we are old pals from the Bronx. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to any recommendations you might have. Thank you. This does not require a vote, so may I have a motion to adjourn? Second, all in favor, we are adjourned. And thank you very much for your presentation.